Minister, you have raised a lot of issues, a lot of key issues this afternoon, and we do want to get the input from the public. I'm sure they're sitting by their phones waiting to call in. So just a brief reminder, the numbers to call in are 465 2555 or if you are overseas you can call at 718-577-2916 that's 465-2555-7 or 718-577-2916 two nine one six so the lines are open and we are expecting your calls if you just joined in you are in tune to working for you the weekly radio program where the people of St. Kitts and Nevis are given the opportunity to interact with their government the team unity government is for the people and of the people and we have a caller on the air. Good afternoon, caller. Welcome to Working For You. A pleasant good afternoon to your hostess. Good afternoon. And a pleasant good afternoon to you, Miss Wendy Fitz. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, my sister sat here mm -hmm. from the beginning of the show. Uh -huh. I've listened in awe mm -hmm. and was spellbound by your oratory powers. And that is no mean measure when I say that. You have impressed me as a person who works, I think, as director of the CIC. That is correct. And when you got into government, in spite of what I understood, if stand corrected, that you were reluctant <laughs> in going there. No you end up there. And let me tell you, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. You captivate me with the way you speak. Your speech is so fluent, so fluid. You, you seems like you're not seen. You're well researched. And my God, I think even the hostess of that program, you had spellbound. <laughs> and you know, you so much for that. You said a few things that touched nerve. For instance, you see this thing where child molestation and incest and they could be squashed by some, either of the, the, the parents taking a bribe, because they call that a bribe, exactly. money. If I'm not going to court, they should introduce a law, like they do in the Virgin Islands and the U.S. Once that case reach to that department, the CPA, mm -hmm. No, no, it's out of the hands of the parents. Mm -hmm. Like compromising, no. That goes right down to the max. Because I could recall a case in St. Thomas where a stepfather molested a stepdaughter. And the judge didn't clear him, you know, 25 years. Mm -hmm. 25 years. Mm -hmm. Some Dominica. Okay. What's all of that to say this? You know, some of the parents here, I mean, let me define that. Let me take back that. You have mothers and you have parents, in my humble opinion. And how I define mothers some, and parents? Mothers are people who, because they're women, they could get a child by the normal means. But parenting is taking responsibility to raise that child. Mm -hmm. For me, that's another story. Now, you have children in this community in which we live having children. And some, most of them, not all, but most of them might have grown up in single parents' homes. And the home in which they've brought up may not be very conducive for child ra raising because. You know, sometimes the language, the behavior of the mother, and what not. And then they dress the children, the little girls from childhood, in a vague and, oh, I must say, um, you know, a woman-like manner, with the skin dress and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm not taking... Sometimes when you tell them, the mother said, bring your so-and-so here. 
to go on some rabbing and, and things like that, you know. Yeah. Sometimes you say, why you speak to the child like that? Why are you pulling your hands like that? The child. If she walk with her, she can't walk with you. Your strides are much more than hers. Mm -hmm. right? Exactly. And I say all of this to show you that. Um, parenting, I, I don't know. If they don't understand, if they're not given an opportunity when they're pregnant to go to um, parental guidance course or whatever. But I think more of that is needed. Mm -hmm. And let me say this before I end. Because somebody else might want to get it. You have said a mouthful and... You know, when I, when I hear you speak, I just get captivated and I can't move from the radio and listen <laughs> to you. Yesterday, your presentation in Parliament was brief, but concise. I mean, how, how, how bet listen, this government can get a better lady on that side than you. I okay. want to say congratulations and keep up the good works, my dear. Thank God you bless you all. Bye-bye. Okay, you. thank you, Carla, for that contribution. Do we have another caller? Yes, we have another caller on the line. Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we are hearing you. Okay, great, great, great. Um, good afternoon, Jamila, and um, good afternoon to Minister Phipps. Good afternoon, um, good afternoon. I, I want to agree with the call. I just heard that the presentation was wonderful. Um, I, I, one of the concerns I have of, of this new team, Unity Government, is their PR and getting the information out. I thought um, Minister Phipps did a really good job in explaining her, 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 her ministry um, today. Um, one of the reasons I call in, though, is a situation I've had personally, and I, I was just going through the manifesto, the immunity manifesto, and I didn't see much specifically on my issue. I'm a young fella at 48 years old, and um, I can't get insurance in my country because of pre-existing situations. Um, it was 2000 when I lost my insurance because I was um, dismissed, well, technically dismissed from the government for political reasons. I am wondering, is there anything that your ministry, uh, Minister Phipps, is going to do for people in my position? I, I'm, I'm certain it's not only me, but pre-existing um, medical conditions have prevented a lot of people for many years, not just in saying it's all over, from having medical um, um, assistance in dealing with their problems. Okay. Now the United okay. States have dealt with it in a certain way. I have still been told in my country by people who are in the know that um, you still, we can't do it in think it. What, um, is there going to be a challenge to that? And if it can, how it can be done? Those are the, the concerns I'd like to raise this afternoon. Thanks a lot for taking my question. Okay, okay. thank you, caller, for calling in. Mm -hmm. I'll give S Senator Phipps an opportunity to respond to okay. your concerns. Okay, well, I will start with the first caller. Okay. Because he did raise a concern as to whether or not we should not be thinking about law revision as it relates to how we handle cases of child abuse and to get around the whole issue of uh, preventing mothers especially from taking bribes in order to keep the pedophiles out of jail. And that is something that is worthy of review mm -hmm. because I think if we don't do that, it becomes a source of continued frustration for the staff of social services and child protection that you do all of this advocacy on behalf of children and then the mothers are not at the court and so forth, but then the caller is correct. Whether or not the mother takes a bribe and if that is the case, she should, should be charged. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, that has nothing to do with the crime that has been visited on this child that the child in acts to have to happen to him or her okay so this this is something that we really need to be working towards and i'm quite certain that within the department that that is something that we will be addressing seriously because we do have cases where it has happened in the past but we need to close those loopholes but then at the same time we have to be very reliant on the support infrastructure provided us by the special victims unit within the police force because we can't bring charges against pedophiles or child molesters but we have to depend on the appropriate government agency to do their part as well mm -hmm. so the prosecution strengthening has to be part of that process in addition to the legislative strengthening now the second caller if I could recap based on my understanding of the question he posed he spoke about the manifesto of team unity and in the context of insurance coverage and I have to assume that he's referring to the promise made to the public of delivering universal health care coverage to persons across the length and breadth of the Federation why is that so 
As it relates right now in the public sector, in government, insurance is provided to civil servants. Mm -hmm. And the ca official carrier for that is National Caribbean Insurance, which is part of the larger construct of the National Bank group of companies, which government is the primary stakeholder within. As it relates to that, and he by extension noted, the caller did, that he was dismissed. He did not divulge what reasons he was dismissed for. But then at the same time, he indicated that once he left government, he found that he no longer had medical coverage. Mm -hmm. And the reason given is, is that he had a pre-existing medical condition. Now, I can't comment specifically to his situation because I will have to know more. But what I will say is that the government's program of coverage when it relates to insurance for its civil servants is such that even when you're no longer working for government, unless you have been dismissed for some serious reason, once you agree to pay the monthly premium, you will continue on the coverage. So that is, as I said, I don't know his particular circumstance. Because, for example, persons who may have retired, let's say you have 25 years in the civil service, but you started working when you were 20. It means that if you choose to retire after 25 years, by 45 years, you still have a lot of life left into you. And you also have the ability to work productively, maybe for another 20 or 30 years. So the option is yours that you can continue paying the money on your own behalf because before then you were paying a piece, government paying a piece, and that way you could have coverage. Now there is nothing stopping that caller from seeking coverage within the private sector. But again, it depends on the policies of the insurance provider of health insurance. Mm -hmm. Bec and, in, and he's right, in most cases, some insurance companies will not carry new um, in insured persons if you have pre-existing medical conditions. That is going to mean down the road that you're going to be exacting large pools of funds out of the fund itself. Because remember how insurance works. It's a large pool of funds and you determine the cost that you charge each customer based on the necessary risk that you expect to cover. So, for example, in our case in St. Kitts and Nevis, as I mentioned earlier, that our biggest health problems are with NCDs, the non-communicable diseases. When we do get going with the universal health coverage, it stands to reason that the biggest amount of claims that we are going to have would be related to conditions um, that arise from having an NCD, whether it is cancer, whether it's heart disease, cardiac issues, diabetes, and so forth. And that might mean anything from the cost of me uh, medication, the cost of an operation, the cost of chemotherapy or radiation. And depending on the severity of your condition, the cost will go up. As it relates right now, we have a situation in the government based on the data that would have been revealed as we went into the estimates program that has just ended. We are just two clients alone within the civil service alone, amounted separately for payouts of somewhere in the region of about $750,000 just for cancer care, and these are civil servants. Now remember that that pool of funds which rep re represents the entire private, um, public sector's contribution is going to impact on the rest of the available funds left in there for other persons like yourself who might not be tapping into the fund, thankfully, because you're in good health, but then it's going to impact on it. So what insurance companies normally do is what they call what are called actuarial studies or assessments and projections where they determine based on risk, because that is what insurance is, a calculated risk that you try to cover for as far as, you, as possible. We, we don't live in a perfect world where they want to make money, yes, but they want to have controlled risk so that they know that the amount they pay out would not bankrupt the owners of the insurance company. However, um, as we did, uh, move closer to the presentation of uh, universal health coverage, situations like the one the caller spoke about with having pre-existing conditions will certainly be a factor. And if we are providing it to the rank and file of the population, then these are things that we will have to account for based on the insurance provider and the packages that we work out. Because if somebody has a prevailing medical condition, so what? Most of us have prevailing medical conditions that we might not even know about, and you only discover it when you take my advice and you go see your doctor once a year. So in that case, are you saying that now that you discover you're hypertensive, some insurance company is going to say that you're not eligible? Well, that same insurance company needs to survive, and you can't survive by making any possible applicant and every possible applicant ineligible, because you still need their premiums that you're going to invest 
with the hope that you have a great return on investment that when you finally have to make a payout for the insurance claim that you still have a good cushion of funds to sit on and make sure you return a profit or dividends for the people who invest in your insurance company. So these are considerations, Carla, that I wish to assure you that um, the Ministry of Health will be taken into consideration because obviously if you have a prevailing condition that's when you need medical coverage most mm -hmm. especially if you do not have the economic means to pay for it out of your pocket or to afford private medical insurance